This is coming out. This is coming out. The fire ground is dynamic. Priorities can change by the second. This series is about our first priority, life priority. We'll hear from the firefighters that have made a grab in live fire conditions, the decisions they made and the lessons they learned. Listen as they tell you about their experience, learn from their mistakes and their successes. Expect fire and expect victims. Expect the unexpected and plan accordingly. This is Life Priority. So to set the time up, it, this was back in 2018. It was actually uh, New Year's, the beginning of New Year's Day. So I think it was approximately 1.30 in the morning. A fire broke out, got dispatched in 27s, first in. I was on, working on Engine 28 with uh, Captain Shani Cornell and Travis Pointer. We responded uh, as part of a residential structure fire. And we were the third arriving engine, fourth apparatus, um, just right behind Medic 21. So engine 27 arrived first with uh, Captain Item. And I believe Scott Baird was the firefighter that day. Just about the time we were about pulling up on scene, 21 took command. That was Captain Ziegler. Uh, Bever Bryce Beveridge was a firefighter at the time, worked in the nozzle seat. I was a firefighter assigned to Rescue 21, but I was working uh, an overtime shift at Station 21. Two other fellows that were there working overtime as well. They were gracious enough to uh, put me up on the engine and they took the medics. So I was lucky to be on the engine that night. Uh, right before we arrived, Captain Item had reported a uh, detached garage fire. I think the, the building was roughly 500 square feet, maybe 600 square feet large. Detached garage, no extension to a, any exposures. When they were getting putting some water on the alpha side of the garage. And she also updated that there was an unaccounted for adult male is what I remember she said on the radio. So gave some indication that there might be a victim on this call. Anyways, I got off. I told Captain Cornell that, hey, I'm going to go meet up and see if they need anything. So ran up, hooked up with Mike Gildone from Medic 21. He said, hey, what do you need? And, and it was a long driveway up this hill to this detached garage. So it looked like they had good steam conversion. I didn't see any fire, but there was, you know, gray smoke pumping out at night. So I was like, okay, let me, we're kind of far from this structure. Let's grab a circ saw and an attic ladder and a hook in, in the chance that we might need it up there. So we grabbed all that stuff, we ran up. It looked like uh, Captain Item was handling the fire just fine with uh, Scott Baird at the garage. They had a good knock on the fire. So I decided to do a 360. I went around to the Charlie side of the structure where I ran into a firefighter beverage. On the MDC notes we had, possible 5150 inside. But didn't really think anything of it because a lot of times we get MDC reports that say possibly someone inside. Nothing was confirmed. The building was a detached garage is what it, what it appeared to be from the exterior. It was just a detached garage. The door was still intact. There was red fire on all three corners of the garage door. First in nozzle was spraying water through the cracks of the garage door. I basically realized that that was not gonna be very effective and was trying to find another way into the structure. I went to the Bravo side, it was a fence, couldn't get through. Went to the Delta side, nothing. Got to the Charlie side and actually finally found a man door. I was trying to force the man door, which was proving to be very difficult and I couldn't understand why. Eventually I had to take the door off completely off of the hinges with my Halligan. About that time when I got the door off is I believe when Captain Katsuyoshi, firefighter Katsuyoshi at the time arrived on a, I think the third due engine. And I realized that there was a bunch of furniture and stuff just behind the door. The door had obviously been barricaded. I assisted him with forcing that door. Once we removed the door, there was a hallway. Looking back at it now, it appeared that it was barricaded but there was just a lot of furniture stacked up in that hallway. At the time, probably just thought it was just storage, but there was like a 60 inch round table on its side. There was a full size dresser. So I'm, once we handed the door off to, I handed the door off to Beverage, I started ripping out furniture out of this hallway and passing it to Bryce and so he can uh, put it outside. So I worked my way, there was probably three to four different large size furniture items in this single hallway, you know, maybe eight feet long, probably less. I pulled out the last piece of furniture, Katsuyoshi went in, 
he made an immediate left and there was like a hallway and they had framed in a bedroom inside of this garage it had been converted so there was a framed in if you went in the hall on the left hand side there was a framed in bedroom katsuyoshi went into that bedroom to search it so i was masking up he went in first i went in behind him i went just beyond that door uh, basically where like they had like a kitchen and a little living area and that's where I ran into this person and he was conscious we were I was on my knees and he was on his knees and I ran into a person and I initially I thought I was running into another firefighter because I'm you're so used to running into other firefighters I was like trying to figure out who it was and then I realized like holy crap this is a person completely black soot covered I could just see like the whites in his eyes so uh, all these thoughts go through your head and you're like oh crap so I grabbed him and uh, right when I grabbed him I, I saw something shiny and I looked up and he had a big old kitchen knife like this big and I was kind of swinging it over my right shoulder so I got really scared and I just and I pushed him and uh, I went back to the front door to tell the other crews that were coming in that there was a person inside with a knife right after I did that and I realized that Katsuyoshi was still inside so I turned around and went back inside and by this time he had moved forward a little bit and Katsuyoshi came out of that room and now he was behind the gentleman and I came in right when Katsuyoshi kind of grabbed him from behind Kurt didn't know that the guy had a knife so I just went straight for the knife grabbed the knife couldn't get it out of his hands. Basically all I could do is just hold his arm down. Kind of a, just a side note, it's kind of weird was that there was something in there, almost like a, something was drawing me in, in terms of like, as I was pulling this furniture, I was getting more and more aggressive for some reason to try and get in there. Like there's some, there was just a vibe, but very light smoke conditions inside, very cold smoke, if at all. So I'm in this room, I turn around, and then I see a silhouette in the doorway that I had just entered to this bedroom. I look, and this all happened like literally this next few minutes of what I'm gonna explain happened probably within 30 seconds, but it seemed like a lot of stuff happened in my mind. Like, to me, I'm like, okay, who is this? Who's standing up here right now with no helmet, no face piece? So it's not a firefighter, most likely. I'm thinking, is this a rescue? Is this a grab? Like, but this isn't a grab or rescue. This is a guy standing there so then the paramedic stuff kind of kicked in like, okay, well, this guy's breathing, obviously he's, you know, he might be altered, but so all that happened like literally within probably five seconds of like, what the hell's going on here? This doesn't make any sense. And then at that point, I told him to get out of the structure. And the second time was very direct, like probably said a swear word or two. I said, you know, get the, out of the structure now, like go. To, just for command presence, like, this is not right. Like, get the hell out of here. You shouldn't be in here. So at that point, I noticed that, again, there was some light coming back from a window behind him. And I think it was just more of all the reflecting red lights from all the apparatus that somehow was bouncing, bouncing towards the, um, behind him. But I could tell that he had basically like a shaved head. And at, as I was closing in on him to try and force him to leave the structure, I noticed that his hand came up. And at that time, it appeared to be a knife in his hand that he was holding. And at that point, I just closed in on him and he kind of like started to hunker down like he wanted to get to the ground. So I just grabbed him and then his left hand at that point kind of disappeared somewhere towards his gut. And I'm just waiting for this knife all of a sudden, like as I'm like hugging him to get him out or push him out, it just, I lost sight of the, the knife in his hand. At that point, um, firefighter Beveridge had saw, saw what happened and he had come in there and was assisting me and basically trying to wrestle this guy to the ground. Firefighter Chris Neese from uh, Truck 23, he was the only guy outside that kind of understood what I was saying. He came in. I could see one narrow path where there wasn't already fire, um, where it looked like those guys had gone in. I went in maybe five to 10 feet inside the door and ran into those guys and they were actively fighting off this guy with a knife. So I, I, I came up on uh, an arm with a, with a knife in it with two firefighter uh, gloved hands holding it back as, they were, uh, as this guy was attempting to stab him. I 
Took me a second to process. That's not something you normally see. So as soon as I processed it, I immediately went for the, the knife. So those guys are in the midst of uh, fighting that guy off. I controlled the arm, pried the knife away from the guy, threw it outside, and then assisted dragging that guy the rest of the way out as he was fighting us. He had pretty significant burns all over his head. You know, his, his skin was coming off his head and his hands were pretty badly burnt. But as far as I know, he survived. I was like, I was surprised that this guy was even conscious. It was moderate to heavy smoke conditions inside. He was completely soot covered. He looked black head to toe. We proceeded to fight him for probably three minutes outside while the medic crew brought the gurney and then we strapped him to a gurney and it was that that was at, by that point that was it so it was a uh, you know then we had a bunch of people once we had pulled them out and we started wrestling them a bunch of people jumped on and helped helped i don't know if it was adrenaline or just the desire to continue the search but i just handed it off and i literally just went i didn't say anything i just went back inside and I continued the search there was a another hallway that led to i think a, a small bathroom with a shower and maybe a, wa a laundry and dryer room and then maybe uh, some storage areas so I just quickly finished this, the primary search on this detached garage, uh, excluding the actual garage itself. It came up clear, negative, and then came back outside and then touched base with Firefighter Beverage. Some of the lessons learned, I think, the, the garage that appeared to be just a detached garage. We have a lot of converted garages in our area and even the ones that aren't converted, people live in them and congregate in them. So I think we should you know, we pretty much consider our garages occupied in our district. Another thing that I thought was interesting was um, just the amount of fire that was in that room that this, that he was in, the amount of injury that he had sustained prior to us getting there. And yet he was still fully conscious, fighting me harder than anyone that I've ever fought before. So it was, you wouldn't think someone would survive in there, but it was obviously survivable. I think the, the rivalry report was pretty good. I did, it didn't appear to like be a large fire based on the, the uh, initial rivalry report from Engine 27. Just I could see light smoke even from the long driveway from where we're at and just making a quick decision. It's like, okay, they got a hose line up there. It's stretched up there. They're getting water and there's conversion. I don't see any active fire. Hey, let's just grab support tools because, you know, at that point, Rescue 21 and Truck 23 are probably just a few seconds out but we can start doing that stuff, especially for a small building. You know, engine, engine crews can do truck stuff, you know, and until a truck company arrives. And it was a super small building. Like we didn't, we had plenty of resources there to handle this type of structure fire, again, with no exposures. And once we went out to the backside, conditions were even better back there other than just being dark. When I found this person, it was very unexpected and surprising. And it took probably five or 10 seconds for me to kind of like get my bearings of what was going on to be able to make any sort of attempt to rescue this person, right? So if everything that we're doing is trying to shave seconds off of someone, the amount of time someone's spending in that environment, <clears throat> if we go into our searches expecting to find somebody, uh, you're gonna be able to make that decision of how you're gonna get that person out or what you're gonna do at that point a lot quicker than having some kind of delay. So when we train, you know, train to find victims and just expect to find people. This, uh, this was, I've never been a, a part of a, if you want to call this a grab or a rescue, this one, this one's certainly unusual. I know we've had, there have been issues with firefighters going to structure fires. And in particular, I think about the Long Beach captain that a couple years back, they got shot going to a structure fire. There's a couple guys on the East Coast that happened to got killed. I know we've had instances where we've gone in on houses and on medical aids and all of a sudden somebody, you know, fires a gun through the doorway as we're trying to make access to help a person. So I know these things happen, but it's super rare. Uh, but there's some key information that I think, the learning lesson I think from this one is, dispatch had relayed some information to uh, Chief Reed, who is the B-13 that night. It mentioned something about that Citrus Heights PD had been out earlier on a gentleman for some sort of 5150 type call. I don't believe fire was ever, or medical was ever dispatched for that incident. Listen to the radio traffic, the recordings and stuff, Chief Reed acknowledged that. The only person I, that I'm aware of that knew that information was Firefighter Beverage. He said that 
while he was getting dressed in the back, he looked at the MDC and it had showed on the MDC, just looking over the captain's seat, that there was, that Supersize PD or something had been out there earlier in that 5150. Not that it changes really anything, doesn't necessarily mean the person's on the scene, doesn't mean the person's like a danger to us or anything. It's just, for whatever reason, everybody else that re responded with their MDCs and listened to radio traffic, nobody else that I've talked to picked up on that. So I think, I think if I had known that there was a 5150 person on the scene, that it might have changed a little bit, my thought process. I think I still would have been more or less aggressive going inside. But I think I would have, we probably would have hopefully communicated better, like everybody on scene, you know, um, that, hey, we got a 5150 person that's unaccounted for. And maybe that was said. Again, radius could have been off, turned down, you're doing other things, the engine's in high idle. And maybe Beverage and I could have made a, a conversation like, hey, there's a report of an unaccounted for adult male, and they're also possibly 5150. Like, let's get a game plan, let's stay together, let's. I don't, I don't know, you know, I guess Citrus Heights PD was on scene as well because of, it sounds like they were there because they knew that they were just recently there for some sort of uh, 5150 type incident. It would have been nice to have known that information. Just, I think just for coordination uh, and a, a game plan of like, what, what are we doing here? And, you know, let's make sure that we're providing some safety for ourselves. On this house, when I made it to the Charlie side, and I didn't notice it at the time, but in hindsight, it makes sense. There was an addition onto the onto the garage, that's where they had plumbed in a bathroom and, and whatnot, and I didn't recognize that right away. But generally when I'm in route to a fire, I'm looking it up on Zillow or Google Maps, and I'm getting a picture of the structure while I'm in route. And really what I'm trying to do, most important thing to do is I'm trying to divide the house in half between the common areas and the bedrooms. We know through data that the bedrooms is, is generally about 50% of where all the victims are found. And then you add hallways and bathrooms into that. Now you're looking at, you know, 60 to 65% of all of our victims are found in those areas. So that's my primary target. So as I'm coming up to the house, I'm sizing it up. I'm looking for the bedrooms. If it's a two story, I'm going to the second floor. If it's a one story, a lot of our houses are ranchers. I'm going opposite of the garage. And basically I'm looking for the hallway or the stairs. Cause if I can find, one of those two things, then that's going to lead me to the bedroom, the hallways, the bathrooms, uh, where I need to be. Um, yeah, so actually a really big lesson that I learned was how to communicate which areas of the house you've already searched. So in that situation, it probably wouldn't have been able to ha happen because we were so busy with victim packaging because he was fighting and we, we, they had to use us to help hold him down. But ideally, the crew that pulled the victim out should go back in and do the search, complete the search, because they already know what's been searched and what hasn't been searched. If you haven't, or if you can't go back in and complete the search and you need to communicate that to someone else, what you've already searched is very hard. So I feel like as a district, if we were systematic in the way we searched, if you just knew that that first crew was going in to search bedrooms, then the crews coming in afterwards can go ahead and search the other areas of the house, or they can say, hey, where'd you get to? And I could say third door on the left, and they already know that I was going to the bedroom. So they'll go to the bedroom, skip a couple doors, and go to the third door on the left. And the only other thing that I wanted to add was that, uh, you know, for other people who may be apprehensive to do something like this and talk about their experience, um, it's not, there's a lot of humility in the fire service, which is great but this is not about trying to make people feel special. This is about sharing knowledge and sharing lessons learned and whatnot. And we all know that the person that gets to grab is just kind of the lucky person to be in that spot at that time. It takes the entire fire ground to make that happen. You can't go in and do an aggressive search if you don't have fire attack going on at the same time, if you don't have ventilation going on at the same time, if you don't know that there's 10 other guys coming in right behind you that are gonna be able to pull you out if something goes wrong. So it's not just individuals within our district that are getting grabs, it's our, it's Metro Fire as a whole that's, that's getting grabs. Fire service is about tradition. One of our traditions is about passing on our experiences and our lessons learned. When we do this, the story doesn't focus on the individual, but the team and the outcome. These lessons are shared 
so that you can better serve the public and your fellow firefighters. If you have a rescue and you're hesitant to tell your story, remember, the lessons you share may help save someone else's life or your own. Share your story by contacting us at lifepriority at metrofire.ca.gov.